Yes. Lady Watermere, as the Chair said, there'll be a little bit of jumping around here, but I will uh, do my best to guide us both through it. Uh, could we begin uh, where we left off? Uh, and the last answer that you gave about it being a cause of concern to you that if ministers didn't see groups of the infected mm. and affected. I've been asked if you could elaborate a little on why that would be a source of concern to you. Well, I think um, justice should be done and should be seen to be done, as I used to say when I chaired my juvenile court. And these were individuals who were going through the most appalling situation, and they needed to believe that ministers understood. Not just be told ministers understood, but to see it and believe it. And of course, ministers couldn't have seen everybody. But I would like to, all my colleagues who had policy responsibility, at least have the opportunity of meeting in a small group just to hear people's direct evidence. And it is a practice I pursued in a number of my responsibilities. I wasn't really the key minister responsible for this particular topic, but my goodness, over the five years, I was involved in one way or another. But I, I feel that probably in today's world, that would happen. When you say that it was a practice that you encouraged during your responsibilities. Do you mean during your time as Minister of State and as Secretary of State? You did well, meet patients. I would meet patients. mental health sort of survivors, mental health um, sufferers. Um, I would meet uh, groups of people who'd had uh, going through cancer treatments. It wasn't as prevalent then as it is now because user groups are very much part of the style and rightly so of health delivery. So the old style of health being James Robertson justice, very paternalistic, patients should be seen, not heard, um, don't speak until you're spoken to. I can remember that as a young mum. Um, that's so changed. Health is now a partnership and it's a dialogue. And I think it would be expected for a key minister to have dialogue with those directly involved. So I don't see it really as a criticism on the past because it wasn't the way things happened then. But it is a reminder, and I wish I'd had the foresight to introduce it. You say that things didn't happen that way then, but as I understood your evidence, you were at that time meeting. Were you something mm. of an outlier? I think that? I was an outlier because of my background. Um, so I came into the health work having, as I say, worked in a child guidance clinic, having been chairman of a juvenile court, having been, you know, I was vice chairman of the Carers National Association for a long, long while. And when I was introduced, they used to say, this is Mrs. Bottomley from the careers organization. They didn't know what a carer was then. They thought oh, that must be careers. So I did have that background and I should have um, uh, developed those practices. I'd like to turn now to interaction specifically with Scotland and more generally with the territorial departments. You say in your statement uh, that uh, there was an effort to present a consistent line, and I asked you about how that was achieved. Mm. Uh, there is another question, which is why was there an attempt to present a consistent line across the four governments rather than allowing a more divergent, locally-based policy to develop? Well, here, Mr. Hill, I shall show my prejudices and my generation. So I believe in a United Kingdom. And uh, I was born in Dunoon, um, but I think there is benefit in the United Kingdom acting as one. Now, I know I'm a dinosaur in this regard, but I think um, it can add to confusion. As you saw over the COVID inquiry with each to, um, uh, part of the country having a slightly different policy. Now, some people will say, isn't that wonderful? That is all part of the evolution. I thought, this is fragmentation, and I'm not sure it helps 
the confused person in the street to know what the right thing to do is. So I don't mean uniformity, because innovation comes out of diversity. And the degree, some degree of devolution to the regions, to the uh, different countries, of course, results in innovation. But on important matters, to me, having a coherence has been something I valued. But I am very old. Uh, in determining what that consistent line would be, what were the respective roles of the Department of Health and the territorial departments or individuals from those departments? And was there a risk that, as you've said, the Department of Health was a bail off compared to the mm -hmm. other departments? Was there a risk that the, the Department of Health's view was always going to be the one that prevailed? Well, I think there's evidence of um, dialogue. Um, and I think Sir Graham Hart used to be the um, permanent secretary in Scotland for the health service there. I think Kenneth Kalman had previously been in Scotland, so there was quite a lot of exchange and goodwill. And where, particularly when um, Tom Sackville was going to announce the look back exercise, you know, he was beaten to, to the start line by the Scots, and he you know, quickly said, let's all do this together. Um, so, and I think remember on cancer treatment, totally different subject, the time where the Welsh had uh, you know, a particular um, sort of head start on various matters. So to me, it wasn't um, um, sort of a bullying Department of Health, but we, we were the largest. We were the ones who were representing uh, Britain at, I used to go to a lot of OECD meetings. I used to go something very old fashioned called the European Community. I used to go to ministers' meetings. Um, and obviously, I, as the, from the Department of Health, would go, not one of the um, different nations. Um, I, was, I was content with it. Did you I ever? Think confusion, forgive me. I think that on matters of health, it's really easy for the public and for patients to be confused. And I think communication and explanation is really important. And so consistent messaging, when you can arrange, secure it, probably helps people. Do you recall receiving any complaints or hints of dissatisfaction from your colleagues in cabinet from Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland? about the way in which the Department of Health was dealing with the territorial departments? Um, not that I know of. Can you help me? No, no, I can't. It was a genuinely open question. No, I can't. I can't. But they would, have, they would have just bumped into me and, you know, duffed me up in the House of Commons. I mean, they wouldn't have... But, but it's they wouldn't not need to make a formal submission. You, you don't remember it being no, a feature of your time? No, it wasn't an issue. Absolutely wasn't an issue. Turning to the haemophilia... Because, so, so, I'm so sorry, I mean, we were the Department of Health, so we were all focused on health. The ministers in the other parts of the country had different responsibilities, and not of which health might well be a minor one, or they wouldn't be a cabinet minister. So my husband was a Northern Ireland minister. I think he had responsibility for agriculture, but I can't tell you it's his top subject. In the HIV haemophilia litigation, were you aware of claims being brought in Scotland as well as those in, in England? I wasn't. Um, not in detail. I understand that you know, in, in Scotland there's a different legal system and therefore there's likely to be some variation. But um, I don't think I could go further than that. I'd like to turn to a questions about your, the, the state of your knowledge at the time, at your time as, as Minister of State and Secretary of State. Um, you wrote in your, your written statement at paragraph 4.22, uh, uh, subsection uh, 2. Um, there, there is a Wait a minute, let's get the uh, 
Yeah, so, um, yes, uh, WITN 52892001. So we're on the 17th of November, are we? This is, yes, the 17th yeah. of November, uh, 1989. It's, it's page 32. Page 32, sorry, Lawrence, yes. 17th of November, 1989. Um, it's the quotation which is taken from a Treasury uh, document um, which refers to the fact that, um, if we go down please to subsection 2, 4.22, uh, and a bit further down, it says it was also reasonable to point out that without the treatment they were given with the blood products, many of the haemophiliacs would have died. Do you remember if you were informed that people with haemophilia would have died had they not received blood products? And if so, do you recall where that information came from? I've always believed it to be the case that for many of the haemophiliacs would have died without the products, and that the products were thought to be a major new development which, of course, with hindsight, turned out to be flawed. I'd, so not all of them would have died, but many would have died. Do you know what uh, the, the suggestion was that those, would have, those people would have died from? I thought they would have died of um, HIV and AIDS. But uh, without, sorry, I, I wasn't clear on my question. Uh, when you were informed that people with haemophilia uh, would have died had they not been given the blood products, oh. what were you being told they, they, would, be, they would have died, died from? Died of. I should know, and I don't. I appreciate this is 30 years later, but yeah. I'm asking you to, to try to think back to... Because the, the H to hep C one was dying of liver failure. I think there's a, there's a limit to how much we can test your memory or what you, your state of knowledge would have been 30 years ago. But are you aware of ever being given a, a piece of work or a briefing explaining to you this is how people became infected and these were the, the risk factors that were being taken into account at the time and this is why imported blood products were being used and this was what was known about the risks from imported blood products. Do you remember a briefing or a document such as that? I don't remember a document like that. But I remember um, just a general presumption that it was necessary to have the blood products, that they were imported, some of them were imported, and at the time I think the imported factor eight was actually thought to be, it was more costly, I think, and it was thought to be a better product. I understand everything with hindsight about that. Um, um, let's move on to the question of no-fault compensation and ex gratia payments more generally. Uh, a, a question which is been raised not just with you but with uh, in respect of other witnesses as well is whether or not the government at the time did serious work and gave serious thought to the possibility of a no fault compensation scheme uh, and if we could have on screen please WITN 5288018 mm -hmm. I don't suggest that this is the only document uh, that goes to this topic, but we can see that on the 14th of December 1990, a uh, minute is sent This is from, for Harriet Harman and then Rosie Barnes's bill. Yes. So it's sent to the uh, Assistant Private Secretary of the Secretary of State yeah. from Mr Philip uh, Chink, 
Um, I don't know what PHS 4D stands for. I don't know if you can help us. Public health? Public health, something. Something. Uh, and it copied to the private offices of all of the ministers of state and the permanent secretary and the CMO and obviously to a number of others as well. If we could just go down to the substance of that minute. It says, I, I enclose a briefing for mm. the Secretary of State of a HS committee, presumably the Health mm. Services Committee, on the 18th of December, comprising speaking notes, the Secretary of State's memorandum of the 12th of December to the HS committee. Uh, sorry, it's the Cabinet Home and Social Affairs Committee, isn't it, the PHS committee. Uh, the position of the medical profession, the CMO, the BMA, and the RCP, uh, RCP Royal College of Physicians. Yes. Uh, then notes on no fault compensation in Sweden and New Zealand, uh, medical professional indemnity in other countries, NHS indemnity, uh, a note from the Lord Chancellor's Department on civil justice review and same department, medical expenses and the award of damages and a note on structured settlements and time limits for claims for personal injuries by minors. The Pearson report from 1978, which you've <coughs> mentioned before, the Lord Chancellor's Department Working Party on Compensation for Road Accidents and a briefing note for backbench MPs. Uh, and then it says, colleagues in the Lord Chancellor's Department, the Department of Social Security, the Scottish Home and Health Department and Welsh Office have confirmed their support for the line proposed by the Secretary of State in his memorandum to the Health Services Committee. Uh, I won't go through uh, all of those documents, but uh, I can tell you from looking at the hard copy that there are some 120 pages mm. attached there. Um, as you say, this was being sent around at the time of a private member's bill sponsored initially by Harriet Harman and then by Thank Rosie Barnes well. in support of a, a no-fault compensation mm -hmm. scheme. Uh, with that as a, a backdrop, did the government consider seriously the prospect of a no-fault compensation scheme? Um, well, I, I can't believe that William Walgrave, fellow of all souls, um, uber brain, would have done this without actually giving it pretty careful thought. So he was the sort of individual who would have said, we've got this policy all wrong. But um, when later um, uh, Sir Graham Hart sort of, um, challenges Jerry Malone, he again says the no-fault no compensation schemes don't work, New Zealand doesn't pay out so much. And certainly, in my experience, as I say, that my social life, what there was of it, was very much talking with medics. They were my... Nobody was saying... I talked a lot to the heads of the Royal College. I talked to the BMA. I don't think anybody was saying to me we should have a no-fault compensation scheme. Uh, I think what we didn't want to do is become like America. So was it given serious consideration? Um, I think this was the serious consideration it was given. And knowing William Aldgrave, as I do... I'm sure he gave it good thought. Your view seems to have been at the time that you were opposed to a no-fault scheme. Has your view changed over time? No. Why not? Because if um, you have to show neglect, negligence, before you can pay compensation, otherwise... Um, it's just an open door. I believe those... I still think there's an issue of causation. I don't think it particularly leads to greater fairness. I think the implications for the licensing authority and the Committee on Safety of Medicines are, are very serious. Um, but if there has been negligence, then, of course, um, there is proper redress. What about a more extensive use of ex gratia schemes, rather than going the whole hog, as it were, to no-fault compensation, or maintaining a line that it's only negligence that will allow for financial support. There have been ex gratia payments in respect of people with HIV uh, as a result of the use of love and blood products. Is, is that a, an approach that you would like to see developed or used more, more widely? I know the pressures, even today, that the health service faces, that there is only a limited pot. And I'm not convinced about 
no fault compensation. I'm not convinced about ex gratia payments. I am convinced about the importance of raising the quality of care in every department, in every service deliverer, up and down the country. So it, I'm sure there may be others who would take a different view, but I have reservations. Because even now, there's an awful lot of litigation. Um, I, if something goes wrong, I can see that people want the matter looked at. Do they want financial compensation? That's the question. Do I take it from that then that you, you don't necessarily see ex gratia payments as a, an effective method of dealing with situations where people have been harmed as a result of NHS treatment but may not be able to reach the bar of proving negligence? I think this is moving into a, a sort of technical area where I don't feel competent to speak. But I think that if there's been negligence, then action can be taken. If there hasn't been negligence, I'm not sure how the decision is made that would be an ex gratia payment. But I do know who would be funding it. The health service would be funding it. The health service as opposed to general taxation, do you think? What is general taxation? There's only so much, as uh, I think John Major said yesterday, you know, there's only so much in the pot. And it's all looking pretty bleak at the moment. And the, um, I mean, the government has put unprecedented amounts, I think I said earlier, 12% of the GDP now goes into health. And it was about 45 to 5% when I was a minister. And I could introduce you to any number of doctors or nurses who can tell you all sorts of ways in which money could be well spent. Turning back to the specific example of the infection of people with haemophilia or with HIV as a mm. result of the use of blood products, Mr Justice Ognall, during his intervention in June 1990, referred to a moral duty mm. on the state as opposed to a legal one. Did you think, and do you think, that there was a moral obligation on the state to do something to provide financial support for people with haemophilia who had been infected? I thought I had an even greater moral duty to ensure the resources available for health were used to the best possible effect. And hugely sympathetic as I was to all those involved and did appreciate the suffering involved, I didn't think that that overrode a wider view that we could not embark on no-fault compensation and the resources needed to be used for the health service as a whole. So I, I'm never sure whether the word a moral responsibility, how helpful it is, because I felt I was trying to behave in as moral a way as I possibly could every day in office with all the conflicting priorities. Continuing um, with a, a, a similar theme, um, did you, I, I've been asked to suggest to you, that given the overall size of the Department of Health budget and the relatively small amount that we are talking about in terms of providing financial support to people with haemophilia and then people with hepatitis C, uh, do you think that the approach towards those groups of, of individuals demonstrated a, a degree of parsimony on the part of the department? I don't. I think there was really serious respect and concern. I think the quality of the 
interchange, for example, with the McFarlane Trust and the Haemophilia Society was of a very high quality and a very senior level. Um, some patient groups would have had liaison with the department at a much more junior level. Uh, but the point was, we were worried about IUDs, we were worried about benzodiazepines, we were worried about CJD, we were worried about um, medical accidents where there had been uh, no negligence. The, the feeling was that once this was a, uh, uh, a situation which could get entirely out of control, the mounting bill for litigation in the health service was already worrying us. We were talking about what was happening in America. And I think the exceptional, the exceptional step was to agree to the first of all the McFarlane Trust, then the 20 million, then the 42 million. And I'm absolutely delighted we did. But I don't think, compared with any other user group, and remember, I was seeing people with HIV and AIDS all the time. So if you'd been a young woman who um, had a relationship with a man who was HIV positive, and you became HIV positive, your baby became HIV positive, all those AIDS sufferers, there was absolutely no compensation for them whatsoever. And you, I understand, rightly so. But remember, I was talking to different patient groups who had no compensation, no expiration of payment. Given the limits on government funding, did the government, to your knowledge, explore the possibility of seeking a contribution from the pharmaceutical companies in order to provide more generous compensation or payments? I don't... I doubt it. I think if a pharmaceutical company is uh, negligent and they're charged, there's one case in the papers about Baxter, and I think they are then pursued. Um, but I think that's this more like the German model. I think it would be a very different model. It, it wasn't introduced then. It hasn't been introduced now. Um, so. You don't recall any discussion of that? I can't get remember any discussion. And I, they were... A um, man called, was called Dr. Keith Jones, I think, who ran the Medicines Control Agency. I mean, these were smart people. Um, but I think, you know, if uh, the pharmaceutical industry was important, is important in the UK, it's an industry we should be proud of, GSK and ICI as it was, Zeneca, and many others. And um, they wanted to be in the United Kingdom because we had excellent research, we had excellent universities, we had excellent teaching hospitals, and we had an excellent system of regulation. Um, we actually had a good system of uh, the PPRS of um, uh, the payment for pharmaceutical products, which gave an allowance for research. And we wanted to maintain the pharmaceutical industry in the United Kingdom with its huge uh, research potential. So I would want to have looked at the papers very carefully to ensure it didn't actually acts as a dis disincentive to the pharmaceutical industry being here before coming to any conclusion. But I have absolutely no recollection of any such suggestion. Uh, should, should I understand that answer that you've just given is, is a hypothetical one? Had that been brought to your attention, yes. that's what you would have wanted to yes, consider. Exactly, thank but you. you don't remember it being brought absolutely to your attention? Absolutely do not. No recollection at all. A couple of further questions on, on HIV before we turn to HCV. Given your interest in, in mental health support, did you or do you consider that there should have been dedicated mental health support provided to people who were infected with HIV as a result of the use of blood and blood products? The, I, I um, would like there to have been. I don't think I was sufficiently aware of exactly what was being provided. So many of the, remember many of the, um, this is one of the areas where the pioneering work with the AIDS community generally and the homosexual community generally, Lighthouse, uh, Mild May, all those other initiatives, they were really pioneering, not only service delivery for people with HIV and AIDS, but counseling. Um, I mean, the other area where I wonder about more counselling is with the look-back exercise. Um, 
I, I understand that some believe that counselling in the way it is now considered uh, wasn't um, extensively available. I think, again, this is looking at the past in the light of the present, because now, on a huge number of traumatic events, counselling takes place. You know, general practitioners re represent counselling. We live in a counselling age, and that uh, people understand more about the traumatic effect of news. Um, there are terrible stories of people just being given the facts and um, sort of told to get on with it. And that's not only in this field, it's all across um, health. So I, again, I think this is something which over the years, thank goodness, that has been service improvement. So I think it would be harsh to criticise what was available then compared with any other services. But I certainly hope that today there will be something uh, which we would recognise as a proper level of counselling. Going right back to your uh, the first few days uh, of your time as, as Minister of State at the Department mm. of Health, was there any handover, as it were, from Mr Meller, any discussions between you or any joint briefing or anything like that? Not a word. Whereas when Mr Waldegrave arrived, I went, drove over to see him on the Sunday night to tell him everything I knew. You were arrived cold, as it were, in the Department of Health. Yes, as but Minister I did know a lot of people there. But this is barristers for you. They drop one brief and move to the other. I won't be drawn on that. Uh, That's what one of the things I said to one of them. I mean, whatever job I did, I always wanted to know. Uh, and I used to talk to Ken Clark about what was happening. He said, oh, but you know, that's your job now. I've moved on. So barristers move on, but people like me sort of fret. Should, should we understand them that it, it, that, that kind of relationship of, of how a minister takes on mm. a brief and how the minister interacts with the, the predecessor in the office or other ministers, there was no set structure. It just came no. down to personality. I mean, it's rather like ambassadors. Some ministers really don't want to know what their predecessor did. They've arrived. They are, you know, they know it all. I remember ringing when Chris Smith took over from me at Heritage. Government changed. And I rang him and said, look, I can tell you anything you want to know. I'll tell you all about the officials. I'll tell you anything. But he really didn't want to know. So people are very different. And I think this may be a gender, I'm going to say very controversial, but this may be a gender thing. Women sort of want to pick up all the information, whereas men think, I can get on with this and sort it. <laughs> a, a, a final question on uh, HIV, uh, at least for now. Um, in terms of your role uh, overseeing social services, mm. were you aware of children of people who died as a result of AIDS, as a result of mm. blood products, being put into care? I wasn't aware. Um, I can imagine that being the case. I, I mean, there was so much stigma at the time. This is what's so deplorable. It was not only that people were dying. It's not only this catastrophic effect on their lives. And particularly uh, for the people um, who were haemophiliac, the stigma on top of, on top of everything else was just appalling. And so I would be really distressed if children were going into care. If they were, I hope they might have gone into foster care. But I'm sh I mean, it's a big country and it may have happened. The HCV uh, scheme for payments, uh, I took you uh, through some of the, the discussions around that uh, using your statement. I'd like to pick up one of the minutes to which you referred in your statement, mm. which I, uh, I, I went through earlier, but I'd like to look at just part of it in a little more detail. It's DHSC 304428 underscore 152. Can you tell me the page? Uh, in your statement, it is at page 139, but we're going to bring the actual... You, you quote from the minutes in yeah, your statement. Right, yeah. I'm, okay. I'm just bringing the actual minute up on, on the screen. It's dated the 5th of June, 1995. Uh, and this is after Mr Malone's yes. uh, conversation uh, and the discussions that followed. It was sent from uh, 
Paul Potlow to uh, mm. the Assistant Private Secretary of, of Mr Malone, the Minister of State for Health, copied to your Private Secretary and the Private Secretaries of others. Uh, and it provides an update on the view of mm. the territorials ahead of the meeting. If we could just look at Wales, please. Yeah, right. Uh, the view from Wales was recorded as being this, and I quote, legal advisers are of the view that it would be difficult to sustain rejection of claims for compensation on the grounds of a distinction between those infected with HIV and HCV. Such grounds are considered insufficiently robust to resist judicial review. Mm. Given the variable impact of hepatitis C on individuals, clinical assessment of the effect will be difficult, at HIV rates, the estimated cost for Wales is around £21 million. If funded out of existing health votes, there would be serious difficulties in delivering other health priorities. The views of ministers are being sought. Mm. The first paragraph, the last sentence of the first paragraph, refers to legal advice. That's all. Uh, yes, it is legal advice from legal advisers. Uh, that the distinction between the HIV mm. payments and the non-payments to people of HIV w was considered insufficiently robust to resist judicial review and hence potentially unlawful. Uh, are you aware of that specific legal advice being brought to your attention at the time? I'm, I, I read the minute. Um, I assume that if um, Department of Health legal advisers took that view, they would have brought it to our attention the there is a later bit of work where I ask for full briefing, again, just to be sure I've got, we have all the arguments uh, and the situation fully analysed, and then I ask for legal advice, so that is really me coming back. And at the time when I left office, the legal advice hadn't arrived. Um, but. I mean, the thing that worries me is a little, little bit, uh, is, you know, it's the clinical assessment of the effect would be difficult. I think it would have been very difficult. Um, so I'm sure in your experience, Mr. Hill, the, all lawyers have given the same legal advice. But in my experience, sometimes, you know, here is a lawyer who doesn't have the same advice as the Department of Health. If there was a question of whether a policy was lawful, would you have expected that to have been brought to your attention as yes. Secretary of State? On um, the same topic, uh, you said earlier in your evidence um, that you thought that Mr Malone uh, hadn't fully read up on, <laughs> as you put it, the, the case law, the complexity and mm. the history of the issue. Uh, what should he have read or scrutinised before coming to his view? I think all the background that uh, Mr Sackville had been um, labouring over for many months and all the, I mean, all the letters that we'd been signing and the debates, um, there's a very good debate with Baroness Cumberledge in the Lords actually on um, Hep C compensation and Lord Annan supports her and says we don't want to become like America where we start providing compensation for you know, a whole, a growing number of conditions. Um, so that is the type of material that you would have expected Mr Malone to have well, read and she, digested. Uh, and uh, uh, Baroness Cumberledge would have been had briefing um, given to her for that debate, but the briefing would have been um, the briefing that was really being handled by Tom Sackville as the responsible minister. Do you know why it was that Mr Malone met the delegation rather than Mr Sackville? I think we, we covered that briefly, didn't we? I think it's simply that they were a senior group. They're probably contemporaries of his, um, and they particularly asked him. I mean, we all, we all met different groups. There's no rhyme or reason. Um, and we met people of all political party or none. And I used to, quite often, Labour people wanted to come in with their trade union who was sponsoring them. I was very sympathetic to that because I'm well being sponsored by a trade union. You know, the least I can do is be helpful and be nice to their trade union. So we all, you know, if somebody's met you in the corridor and says, can I bring a delegation or can I have a meeting? On the whole, uh, we wanted to be reasonable. There, weren't, there were only so many hours in the day. But I wouldn't make 
very much of that at all. Turning to the, um, the Eileen Trust mm. uh, and the setting up uh, of the Eileen Trust, a, a couple of points to take from that. Um, 6.39 of your statement, which is page 109. Um, now, I appreciate that you weren't involved in the detail of this, um, but just so that we are clear, the, there were two elements to the, the payments to people without haemophilia who had been infected, just as there were to people with haemophilia. Right. There was a lump sum payment. Which the department was doing. Which the department was doing. And then there was a payment... Discretionary. Discretionary by the trust. The lump sum payment from the department was not subject to the same... <coughs> if I use the word delay, I use it neutrally mm, here. Right. It wasn't subject to the same delay as the setting up of the trust. The lump sum payments were made by the department earlier than the trust was commenced. Is that right? It is right. And I think this is all about the McFarlane Trust felt that their primary commitment was to haemophiliacs. They were a charitable trust, and it was haemophiliacs they minded about. So the department wanted to use the expertise of the McFarlane Trust to help with the Eileen Trust but the Eileen Trust was a separate charitable structure. And I think there was a long time working all of this out and deciding who should be the trustees and how the trustees should work and so on and so forth. That's, that's my understanding of reading the papers. Uh, as we know from a, a document that we saw uh, before and the, the chair was discussing with you, Leaving aside the exact numbers that we're talking about, this isn't a large number of people, is it? Mm. It's, it's around yeah. 100. Uh, the point I'm asked to put to you Sorry. is that with a, a relatively small number of people, people who were infected with a disease that was thought to be terminal at the time, mm. and a trust which is set up to alleviate hardship, there was, was there not, a priority to get this up and running as quickly as possible? Well, I would think so. But I think it's also true that whenever the government sets up any project, there is always subsequent scrutiny that says it was poorly set up, it wasn't properly founded, they hadn't got the constitution right. Um, some of that has come back in very, very different contexts, but the furlough payments uh, with COVID, uh, the government was desperate to get it out. And of course, it was all done in a hurry, and subsequently people have said, well, was the system flawed? In this, for this purpose, um, I entirely agree these people needed help. There wasn't a large number. But actually, the number isn't quite the point. What they were doing is trying to get the trust established, the trust deed, uh, and all the rest of it, and the, and the trustees. There, there was a precedent to work from, of course, wasn't there, in the McFarlane Trust, even if a, um, the McFarlane Trust itself wasn't going to take on that role? Yeah, there was... Um, a, a comparator, yeah, I swear, a sort of a precedent, but it was maybe it was the difference. But I think I've said at the end, you know, I feel that the um, uh, Eileen Trust should have got a move on. And again, I don't really understand why it wasn't brought to my attention or maybe to Mr. Sackville's attention, because in general, um, you know, people in the House of Commons are only too keen to tell you that you're, you know, failing on your homework and why haven't you delivered um, and it's it's a good thing about the House of Commons keep people keep you on your toes it would have come up in a parliamentary question I mean there are all sorts of ways which that could have come to light very easily so I'm you know I would want to understand more why at the time there wasn't more push on it the role it's, it's unsatisfactory and it took so long the role of the, the CMO um, I, I'm not going to take you to Lord Clark's transcript, um, but there is reference in that. Um, I'll just give the date so that people have it for their notes. Um, 
27th of July 2021, uh, and internal pages 30 to 31, and page 213. Um, Lord Clark, if I may summarise it pretty broadly, said that he felt that it was a minister's job to challenge advice that was given, even if it came from the CMO. Mm. Uh, firstly, what are your views on that? And, and secondly, how much of the degree of challenge uh, comes from the personality of the, the individual Secretary of State? Well, if um, the CMO was giving advice on the best treatment for haemophilia or HIV and AIDS, I would um, re believe that his um, opinion was worth a great deal more than most secretaries of state who are not medically qualified. So if it's a medical matter, the CMO must have paramountcy, but of course be challenged by challenging uh, Mr. Cl uh, Lord Clark, Lord Clark would have meant debate, scrutinize. Um, it's not supposed to be discursive challenging, it's just interrogating. And that is exactly what ministers did all the time. But nevertheless, the CMO was ultimately had an independence and could speak out independently. So it was a challenge within a context, within a framework. It, it wasn't then simply accepting the CMO's advice, but giving it weight and, where necessary, you know, interrogating it. Is, is that a... Yes, I mean, not, I mean I'm, one of the things that took a great deal of my time was the health of the nation policy. And this was really trying to make progress on um, cancer, mental health, heart disease, sexual health, and accidents. And throughout that, the chief medical officer's role and um, opinions, and he and his team, uh, were crucially important. But depending on the subject, it wasn't, they weren't um, regarded as sort of sacred text. But Mr. Clark would challenge anybody. That's, that's his nature. That's why he's so successful. Just, um, sorry, going back uh, to this question of legal advice from the Welsh mm. Office, um, if we go to page 141 of your statement, um, perhaps if we could have this on screen as well, Lawrence, WITN 5289001. Um, uh, you mentioned yeah. um, this question of legal advice being provided to you. If we just look at uh, number 13. On the 3rd of July 1995, yeah. Mr. Pudlow, and he was the author of the, the memorandum, the minute yeah. that we looked at earlier, provided an update to my private office following the 21st of June meeting with an attached paper setting out quite extensively how officials saw the issue. There is an endorsement on the submission to the effect of the private office. Private office rang on the 5th. Uh, of July, Secretary of State has seen and noted no further action needed at present. Uh, this was the exact time when Mr. Mm. Dorrell and I were effectively swapping Secretary of State roles. I therefore cannot be sure whether this note from the private office of the Secretary of State was briefly <coughs> communicating my views as the exiting Secretary of State or the initial views of Mr. Dorrell as the arriving Secretary of State. If it is uh, communicating my response to the submission, I would undoubtedly have known at this time that I was moving departments mm. and I would not have made a major policy change just as I was exiting. Whether to make such a change would be a decision uh, to be made more appropriately mm. by the incoming Secretary of State. So that is uh, the context. Uh, and uh, I understand from that paper that um, Mr. Pudlow uh, gave, uh, referred in the paper to the, the point made in the, the Welsh office. Uh, the mm. review of the Welsh Office mm. that he had previously conducted, that, that there was a legal question mm. that was being investigated. So uh, the documents are there for yes, people to are. check, should they wish to do so. Um, I've read that. And um, what I think here is that I don't entirely like what's been said. No further action needed at present. I think what this expression, I don't know whether I saw this paper or not, or when or how. But I think I would have said, this is, you know, the, the, the time isn't right for a change of policy. That's what I'm really saying. 
they haven't yet got, it's not put out fully, they haven't yet got the legal advice. And there will come a moment when the new Secretary of State will probably want to look at this information alongside the legal advice to see whether he has a different view. This is rather like the memo that was left for me from uh, David Meller, where he'd asked for, as it were, a, a review of where we were and whether he saw that or not, it, there, there wasn't any imminent uh, decision to be taken, but it fed into the evolving policy. The, the, the point that was raised in the Welsh office uh, oh, summary yeah, yeah. was not ignored. There was a, a, a continuing, continuing thought being given to that. Good, issue. and then we would have been waiting for the advice. Legal advice has been requested and hasn't yet arrived. Does it say that somewhere? I'm, I'm just going to turn, I may, to the question of the uh, HCV look back. Um, now, as I understand it from your witness statement, that was not a, a policy area in which you were directly, particularly closely involved. The decisions were generally taken by Mr. Sack. Mm -hmm. Is that right? They were. You were kept informed, or at least your private office yes. was kept informed in, in general terms. Uh, one of the questions that I have been asked to ask you is about why the look back hadn't occurred earlier. Uh, it is a question that you address uh, at page 130 of your statement, uh, paragraph 7.29. We could have page 130 on screen, mm -hmm. please. Um, it, it says... Uh, yeah, the, there was no effective treatment, it was thought, and it was technically difficult. It, um, ex exactly so. I'm, I'm just going to read through uh, that section so that, that everybody has it in mind. Um, in your written statement, you said this. The inquiry asks why a look-back exercise had not been undertaken earlier. This was explained in Mr Schofield's submission of the 22nd of December 1994, uh, which is a submission which is referred to earlier in your, uh, in your statement um, at page 124. Uh, and that is a submission that went to Mr Sackville, not to you. But what it said in the submission is this, and I quote... Uh, until recently, it was considered that look back to identify recipients of blood transfusion who are at risk would be technically difficult. Mm -hmm. And as there was no effective treatment to inform people they were at risk when there was nothing that could be done about it, would increase distress without any benefit. The position has changed on both counts. There is now some confidence that many, but not all, recipients of blood infected with hepatitis C can be identified, mm -hmm. and some treatment regimes using interferon alpha have been licensed. So that is the explanation yeah. that was given about why it wasn't done before and why it is being done now. Just to pick up a couple of points from that, um, the first issue is, is, is technical difficulty. Uh, I assume that that is not something that you are able to assist us with now no, as to what that technical difficulty was. But uh, you can, I can well understand why it would be technically difficult. Um, I, I think that is something that we can look at elsewhere. Uh, in terms of the other reason given, no effective treatment, mm -hmm. hence it would cause people distress, just two points from that. The first is that while there may have been no effective treatment, there were things that people could do to reduce their risk, um, such as avoiding alcohol, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, um, do you not think that that would have been a, a, a good reason at least to seek to do the look-back exercise earlier? I think, I mean, the, what I... I appreciate that point. On the whole, I think people are better informed of their conditions, even if that's distressing, because there's nearly always something that can be done. Uh, what I was struck by was the BMA response. Uh, Dr Bogle... Uh, and really it was a handwritten letter by Jeremy Lee Potter, who was the head of the BMA. And this is um, paragraph, um, sorry, this is 725. Is Page 127, please, Lawrence. Yeah, well, and then 128. He's extremely grudging about the whole, um, whole thing. Um, what do you say? First people will, I'm so sorry. The undertaking will be major, this is Dr. Bogle writing to Dr. Yeah. Metters, Deputy yeah. Chief Medical Officer. The undertaking will be major and will place a considerable administrative load, not only on the regional blood transfusion centres, but on hospitals. 
Hospital blood banks, okay. records departments and doctors are already carrying very heavy loads. If the hospital consultant feels it inappropriate for the patient who has received blood from a donor who subsequently tests HC, hepatitis C, positive to be contacted, then an equivalent load will fall on the GP. Next paragraph. Tracing patients who have, recent, uh, who have received potentially HC positive blood is probably worthwhile, but it does raise the question as to what the aim of it is. The first response from a patient will probably be terror, and the second, litigation. It, is, it also is vital that any chance that the patient will connect hepatitis C, often called HCV, with HIV and AIDS must be absolutely minimized. Um, but essentially, this is a very grudging response to what looks like a responsible and enlightened move. I think it is the case that um, in the UK we had the first look back exercise, I think, anywhere in the world. So um, uh, these are points I I pick up since having read these papers, but they are not points that I would have been aware of at the time. At the time, I would have thought that um, you know, Mr. Sackville's got sort of irrefutable advice that we should move with this and move we did just looking at those explanations given as to why it wasn't done earlier and appreciating mm -hmm. that these were were not your uh, reasons mm -hmm. these were reasons that were provided to you uh, and that you are looking back on now you spoke earlier in your evidence about the importance of the department of health being truthful with patients mm -hmm. the idea that because there was no effective treatment then patients shouldn't be burdened with the knowledge that they had hepatitis C. How does that fit with the idea that the Department of Health should be truthful with patients? Well, they were being truthful if they didn't know that they had hepatitis C. Until they were tested, they wouldn't have known. But this was an argument that used to madden me about HIV. Um, in the early days, when I was first uh, Minister of Health, I was always being told oh, no, we can't test for HIV because there's no treatment. Or if we do test, there's got to be a lot of counselling. A lot of people won't want to come forward for testing. And I felt that, you know, in the health service, we need to know. People need to know if they've got a highly infectious disease. And there were people going into hospital, and uh, I'm kind of thinking about my many medic relations, and if you have a patient who's got any infectious condition, you should be able to test them. But the, there was a theology around not testing unless you've got an appropriate treatment, which is what I had many arguments with various medics about it. At the time? At the time. Is that an area where a minister is perhaps not as deferential to doctors? Because it's not a matter of, of medical expertise, it's a matter of policy and of uh, essential common sense as to whether or not somebody is told about a condition that they have. Right. And, the, and, a matter ethics. Of and it's very different, thank you, um, Sir Brian. I mean, this is a huge change in medical fashion. So 40 years ago, you know, if a patient had cancer, the doctor would say, look, I'm sure, have a cup of tea, or, you know, I'm sure it'll all be all right. I mean, there was huge concealment. And this is one of the issues around the GMC's findings that that it is, has increasingly become not just the fashion, but the rule that you must alert patients to all the risks of any treatment. But I think that is, that is something that has changed over the decades. But from your previous answer, you were arguing that at the time, in terms of informing patients that they had an infectious disease, uh, well, I didn't regardless win. of whether or not there was a treatment available for it. Well, that's what I thought. That's what, that was my view, but none of the medics didn't agree with me on this. But I carried on banging them up. And then gradually, uh, the fashion changed, and there was more encouragement of people with HIV to be tested. And this was all the issue around, if they had a test, then they would, uh, by just having a test, they would jeopardize their insurance, jeopardize their mortgage, because the question said, have you had an HIV test? It didn't say, were you HIV positive? Just having had the test gave you the waiting. But that doesn't entirely help you with when the look back exercise should have started. But um, I, I, I don't, I, 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 I'm not going to press you on when it should have started because you weren't involved at the time. It was more the underlying ethical question mm. that, uh, that was of interest there. And that the 
the argument that you shouldn't tell patients yeah. because you couldn't treat them wasn't well, this one is like, you subscribe to. This is Dr Bogle's point. Terror or litigation or something. But I don't, I, that's why I was sort of shocked by his comment. If a claimant has a, a case in law, um, they, they're entitled to bring it, are they not? I, I think you nodded at that. Well, I was, wasn't entirely the meaning I was taking out of that, but... Um, would you um, just excuse me for a second? A couple of late questions have been um, passed up to me. Uh, the, the question um, is posed, uh, did you ever consider the position of, that the Irish government talk, took over non-fault compensation scheme to compensate uh, people with haemophilia who were infected um, in a, uh, an identical way to people in the UK using US contaminated products? Uh, and if so, uh, why did you not recommend replicating that scheme? which recognised ex extreme pain and suffering uh, of people who were infected with several viruses? Uh, there may be something in the documentation about it, but it's not something I have any recollection of. So those are the questions which have been put forward by the core participants, or at least some of them. Um, and I turn now to see if you have any questions for Lady Bottomley. Have you checked with uh, the representatives for the okay, so Baroness? I, for, forgive me, I didn't, but I'm told no. So the, no, no more questions? Uh, I'd say, uh, sorry, so I, I didn't, but, but were none from you, sir. Just, just oh. for me. No, uh, for me, there, yes, there are. Yeah. Uh, three three um, li little areas. The, the, the first uh, is, did you personally meet any trustee from the McFarlane Trust? Not to my, um, not in my memory. So when you spoke of the way in which they interacted with the department, Storn you were relying upon others. Yes, I was relying upon Storn Heppel and the, ha and the exchange of correspondence between them and the department about Straw and Heppel and his help, and, and vice versa, his constant comments about you know, the spent sense of trust. I think um, William Wargrave met them at one stage, um, but I don't believe I did. But, Sir Brian, I might have, I might, I might be damning them. Maybe I met them three times at various events, but I don't remember it. Thank you. Um, the the, the second is something which Mr. Hill touched on in the questions you've just been answering, uh, and it, it's, um, it, it's this. Uh, when you began your evidence, uh, you mentioned that you are uh, on oath, and the oath, of course, is to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, and then you said that you thought that doctors must be truthful. Now, is that also, uh, in general terms, not just being truthful, but the whole truth, and nothing but the oh. <laughs> Doctors must be truthful, and I think they're very much more direct than they used to be. So I could go through a number of uh, doctors in different clinical practice. You know, when uh, uh, doctors handle very painful situations, which are likely to have a very gloomy outcome often, and how you present the information is part of the skill of the professional. But they must not be untruthful. They must they be bold, direct, and um, insensitive? No, but they must be truthful. Does it follow from that answer that, uh, in your view, they need not necessarily tell it like it is so long as what they do say is truthful. <laughs> I think most doctors would weigh up the patient in front of them. But um, I've got a daughter who served on the General Medical Council. And, I mean, 
and my closest cousin who spent 30 years as a doctor at St. Thomas's, and they are brutally direct. Um, maybe there are some doctors who aren't quite so academic, and they have what I'd call more of a bedside manner style, and maybe their approach is um, less brutally frank. Well, sympathetically direct rather than brutally direct, perhaps. Correct. Yes, I see. Thank you. Um, the, the third um, is, is this. Um, as you've been answering questions, uh, you've been making notes. Has that been your habit? All my life. So it follows that when you were Minister and Secretary of State, you made notes in the same way? All the time. Now, what happened to those notes after the meeting? I, papers everywhere, and nothing happens to them. I've never done a memoir, I've never done an autobiography, I've never done anything. But for me, making notes helps me concentrate. Now, they were your private notes. How, how were they kept? They were just put up in sort of boxes and in the end thrown away. When, who, who threw them away? Did you? Or? I'm afraid I probably did. I see. I'm terrible. I'm still, and I, I'm, to this day, I have, I'm still even... In the, in the era of um, the internet, I still write notes and have endless bits of paper, which I purge. Yes, well, thank you, thank you very much. I regret it. I wish I had written a, done as well as my colleagues in writing about themselves, but I'm, <laughs> I'm not interesting enough. Lady Bottomley, uh, as with all of our witnesses, uh, there is an opportunity at the end of the questions to uh, allow you to say anything more that you wish to say? Mm. Well, I've only got three small things to say. And the first is that participating in the inquiry about events 33 years ago has been incredibly demanding. Now, like then, I've really endeavoured to be candid. It's reminded me of the great privilege of serving in the Department of Health with fellow ministers I really trusted and respected, in a government I really trusted and respected, and particularly working with senior officials and experts who were real public servants, people of integrity and commitment. And I'm sure for all of us there will be lessons to learn from the inquiry, Sir Brian. But much more important than that, this experience has reinforced my appreciation of the depth and the extent of suffering and the loss of 3,000 who've died, and the much wider group of family and parents and children, and spouses and friends whose lives have been traumatized and distorted by this experience. I respect all those infected and affected who've been participating so fully in these proceedings, and I really hope the inquiry brings some resolution and closure. But I mean that in a really sincere and heartfelt way. And thirdly, we're meeting in the shadow of the London School of Economics. I did a master's degree at the LSE in the Department of Social Policy. My mother-in-law went there, my husband's grandmother taught at the LSE, and my great-grandfather worked with the Webbs and was a signatory for the LSE. Now, the founding father of the Department of Social Policy was Professor Richard Titmus. And his seminal book was The Gift Relationship. And that's about the incredible altruism and the voluntary relationship between blood donors and recipients. And I know, because as a young mother, I had eight units of blood. That blood and blood products should be responsible for such suffering and devastation of individuals and families is an absolute outrage. Thank you for letting me participate. Well, th thank you from, from uh, where I sit. Uh, you described yourself as not very interesting. I think you've been interesting to us. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow. Uh, Lord Horham tomorrow. Sir. Lord Horham tomorrow, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock tomorrow.